I don't want no oil. A spoil in my shoreline. I like fish much better than crud. I like birds and things. A creeping and crawling won't trade no more oil for blood. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes run by them poops who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit for a dog. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that nuclear power's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. No news. Good morning, Toledo, and good afternoon, Columbus, and hello to those of you listening on the internet, wherever and whenever you are. This is Joe Demar, along with my co-host Rebecca Wood, and. <laughs> We are, trust me, she actually is here. She's just furiously making notes. I promise I'm here. Okay, good. (laughs) And uh, you have tuned in to For a Green Future. Uh, For a Green Future is a program where we talk about the environment. We talk about ecology, and we talk about it in ways that affects you, your family, your health, your wealth, your pocketbook, your happiness. And uh, we've got a pretty good show lined up for you today. We have an excellent guest coming on, uh, Dr. L. Campan. Uh, formerly of the, retired from the University of Toledo, and we're going to be talking about alternative energy and just how practical is it really. I mean, you keep hearing people say, oh, we can't possibly power our country with wind and solar. It's just too unreliable. And they're saying that even as other countries are switching over and powering their countries with wind and solar. So, um, But Al's an expert on this, and uh, he'd be welcoming your, welcoming your calls as we would at 866-240-1065. Uh, this is a call-in show, and we rely on your calls for feedback and f- to tell us stuff we don't already know. And um, this is the best show in Ohio, but it gets better every time you call in at 866-240-1065. So we're going to talk a little bit with Al, then we're going to ta- give you another HB6 update. And, you know, it's coming to a head. They have to turn in their signatures by... October 22nd, or the whole referendum collapses and First Energy gets their way and they get to stick extra money on your bill. So, the, But the battle is heating up. It's going full strength in the streets of all over the state of Ohio. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Then we're going to introduce you to something you may not have heard of, something called the Michindo, Michindo Aquifer. And then... Uh, more of your calls, and then we will just have a wonderful day because any day that starts with For a Green Future is a good day, in my opinion. So before our guest calls in, he'll be calling in about 8.15, just a few bits of news, eco news, I'd like to catch up on, list a couple things going on. One of them is that the European Union, which is kicking our butts in terms of sustainability, I'm sad to say, just passed a law uh, that's called the right to repair law. And that is a law which says that manufacturers of items like washing machines and electronics have to make their products repairable. Now, that sounds kind of simple. It sounds kind of, well, of course they should be repairable. But no, actually, a lot of manufacturers purposely make their products so that they can't be repaired, that once they break down, all you can do with them is toss them in the landfill. And since the Europeans are striving for sustainability, that is closing their loops, getting all the resources and all the stuff that they use to make stuff, 
once that breaks down, they want it to be reused. So now they've passed a law saying that manufacturers must make their products repairable. And we are hopefully going to do a whole show on this at some point soon. I have a, there's a fellow who owns a repair, a cell phone repair business who said he's willing to be a guest on our show at some point, but we're, it's been a matter of scheduling. I, re- I heard someplace that it creates an entire football field of waste when you throw away a laptop. Hmm. No, oh, wait a minute. No, cause those were like the, those were PCs. Those were like little desktop computers. And it was the 80s. I wonder how much waste it creates now, more or less. Mm, well, the devices com- have got smaller, but I don't know whether that means anything or not. Yeah, well, it, it's still, I mean, when you manufacture, when you mine the metal to make the case, that creates a ton of waste. Then, of course, a lot of the processes where you create uh, computer chips also produces toxic waste because they etch using sulfuric acid. And, and so the more you can reuse a product, the more you can repair it and continue using it, the, the better it is for the environment. And so also one other thing is that it creates tons of jobs mm-hmm. because there's lots of people who could work in the repair industry. And that's something that is a way for people to get their own small businesses. Usually these repair shops are small, locally owned places and they employ, you know, a fair number of people, and and it's a as opposed to the, that the economic benefit of a repair is local, as opposed to the economic benefit of a manufacturer, which often goes out to China or someplace that doesn't really benefit us. So, kudos to the European Union once again. They they have sh- shown us the way, and the question is, are we smart enough to follow? There's a thing, though, where they, they update everything so that your old computer, which old meaning three years ago that you bought, nothing works on it anymore or everything takes, you know, 45 minutes to load or something. Yeah. I don't know how you get around that exactly. Planned obsolescence is yeah. a has gone hand in hand with technology ever since they started. Uh, and it's not really because they improved in it. It's more wonderful now. It's just because they want you to buy a new one, and they have dirty tricks to make you do that. Yeah, well, actually, the first uh, case of planned obsolescence, interestingly, the history of planned obsolescence is very interesting because it came with light bulbs. Ah. <laughs> because the original light bulbs, the original incandescent bulbs, way back at the turn of the 20th century, they manufactured them. They worked great but they burned forever. (laughs) They lasted forever. Well, that's bad. You can't have that. Right. (laughs) Who's going to make money replacing them? (laughs) Exactly. People would just buy a light bulb, and then they'd have a light bulb for the rest of their lives. And In fact, there's a light bulb from that time Ah. (laughs) uh, that's still – it's been going continuously at a fire station. Um, I forget where it is. I think it's in California. But that light bulb has been burning continuously for over 120 years. Holy smoke. uh, and so what happened is all these companies that got into light bulb manufacture got together and said, we can't have this. You know, people just aren't <laughs> buying enough light bulbs. We've got to redesign the filament so that it's fragile and that after a while it'll burn out and break. That's not what they taught us in grade school. <laughs> it's, it's supposed to be something of fire safety or better materials or some yeah. nonsense. Well, actually, and our, our, our able... Uh, Technician Russell has pulled ah. up uh, something off the Livermore. internet. Livermore, it's in Livermore. The world's <laughs> longest burning light bulb is in Livermore, California. So wow. It's called the Centennial Light, and it's been burning. I'm sorry, not for 120, only 116 years. Oh so well, wow. that's be, not impressive at all. Got to be accurate on that. Yeah. So, so this is a very, um, uh, this is a very nasty thing, and the, the reason and the idea that you have to keep manufacturing new stuff, even when the old stuff was perfectly good and worked fine, in order to keep the economy going, that has to change. I mean, essentially what has to happen is people have to get paid enough for, for making that one light bulb that they can survive, even though people won't be continuously buying light bulbs for their entire lives. Do you know what I mean? If wages were high enough that people could survive making one light bulb per household, per year, yeah. uh, then we could get by on that, and we wouldn't destroy the planet in the process. Of course, fashion does the exact same thing, but you can circumvent that by just be willing, being willing to look like a dork. 
<laughs> I do it all the time. Well, or you could just wait for your fashion to cycle back around. Right. So, yeah, yeah. That, that I've lived long enough at that point. That, 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 that's happened. Yeah. yeah. Except be, for there's a rule, Joe. There's a rule. Oh. If you if you wore it the first time, you're not allowed to wear it the second time. Uh-huh. Hmm. Guess, fashion, guess what I think about that rule. The, the fashion police will then come and <laughs> they will. confiscate. Yeah. They will, you will be the object of derision. You know, it's funny because we just watched <laughs> Earth Girls Are Easy, my wife and I. Oh. It's a great movie. <laughs> yes, it is. And uh, <laughs> very 80s clothing in that. But some of those outfits I, I saw in that movie, I was like, oh, people are dressing like They're that back. again. And, oh, the uh, 90s are back. That Like the belly shirts that look good on two people in this entire country. Right, yeah. I'm, I'm not one of those people, in case you're wondering on the radio. Um, one other quick thing before we go to our guest, and he's, and he's already called in. It's great. Um, very eager guest. I like that. Uh, and I just wanted to mention that today is the uh, bird census at the, out at the Ottawa Wildlife Refuge. And uh, it's just good to note that there's people who are so passionate about the environment, who love birds so much that they're willing to volunteer and go out and do these censuses and count, literally count the birds. Uh, that's how we know that bird populations are declining, unfortunately, because they go out there every year and they can compare the numbers and the number of toxins and so forth we're putting into the environment has taken its toll on birds. You've probably seen the headlines that bird populations are down by 30 to 50 percent. And the causes... Again, the causes are not a mystery. Um, there have been a number of studies, and in fact, back during the West Nile virus scare, when I lived in New York State, they had a West Nile, no, West Nile virus scare, and so they were thinking it was carried by the birds, and so this Department of Health autopsied literally every single dead bird anybody would send in to them from well, the whole state. Well, now that must have been a delightful job for oh, someone. Yeah. I know. That would be interesting to have on a resume is <laughs> yeah. a bird uh, bird obituary person. Yeah. Well, they found that the overwhelming cause of death of birds was not West Nile virus. In fact, 90% of the birds that people, dead birds people found and sent in had died because of pesticide exposure. No, oh, geez. And so this is another case where the chemicals that we're spraying into the environment are what's destroying the environment. Mm. And the solution is to stop spraying those chemicals and switch over to more organic agriculture but somehow the headlines you know birds populations are dying off and that the cause extra pesticide spraying doesn't link up to any action given our current uh, state of government and who's running it so okay i was talking to a friend of mine the other day who is from the akron area around this set of lakes that are in akron and she was saying that you know she's going to have a lot of difficulty your family's going to have a lot of difficulty being able to go out of their house even uh, because of the lakes and the, and the skeeters unless something is done. Well, I mean, what you need to do in that case is put up a ton of martin houses and bat houses and bluebird houses. That's a thought. Yeah, bluebirds can eat. Bluebirds can keep, a one bluebird family can keep an acre of, of land free, almost mosquito free because they. I bet her dad would have fun with that too. He like he's one of those guys who likes put you know putting little landscapes and. Things up on his property and little, little digging little ponds and putting yeah. up little gazebos and stuff and decks yeah. and. So tell him to put up some little bluebird houses and the next year won't be so bad for him. There we go. All right, and uh, the future won't be so bad for us if we switch over to ecologically and environmentally responsible energy sources in Indeed. time to stop to head off this catastrophic global warming. And our special guest today, Dr. Al Kampan is someone who has studied uh, this question and this process, and we're very grateful to have him on the line. Uh, Yay. Dr. Kampan, are you on? Hi, hi, Joe. Yeah, I'm on. Hi, great. How do you, how do you want me to address you here, Dr. Kampan, Al? What, how should we do this? Uh, I, w- I would prefer just use, using my first name. Okay, Al. Al. <laughs> well, thanks, yep. thanks very much for coming on. Oh, it's my pleasure. Okay. So, uh, Al, you and I got got together a number of years ago, back when Davis Vesey was doing its relicensing application. And right. what we were doing in that relicensing application uh, 
where we were trying to prove, and in fact, I believe we did prove, that First Energy would have been better off switching over from the nuclear to wind and solar and, al and clean alternative energies and closing the nuke plants. And uh, you helped us out quite a bit with, with that. So could you talk a little bit about what we found, what you found uh, at that time, and then we'll then we'll update our, on what sure. the new what the current situation is. Sure. Well, uh, one of the things that we needed to show is that there were alternatives to to Davis Bessey, and um, alternatives that would be have a lower impact on the environment. And the case that we made was that wind and solar could easily replace the generating capacity of Davis Bessey, as long as you put um, you include some means of storing energy and delivering delivering it when you needed it. So one of the issues that most people hold against wind and solar is that it's um, it doesn't have a, a very high capacity factor. Namely, is it available when you need it? Um, and so we linked the fact that there were lots of opportunities for electricity storage. First of all, there's no real concern about having enough sources for wind or locations for wind turbines or locations for putting solar, whether it's ground mounted systems, large fields, or whether it's rooftop. So there's plenty of generating capacity. But yeah. like the typical modern customer wants to have electricity available whenever he or she needs it. So that store, there are a whole variety of ways that you can store electricity. It's not so, it's generally not considered to be so easy, but in fact, there's a lot of storage that's going on already now, and ever more um, types of storage is coming online and being available. So, so that's certainly not a problem. Well, we had that one guy on was it last week, a couple of weeks ago, about the new kind of batteries he's making. Oh yeah, two two weeks ago we had a guest on talking about the utility scale lithium ion batteries that are coming online now. Exactly, they got the good new stuff now. Right, and the price for the, that battery storage is coming down all the time. But one of the things that people don't recognize is that when the nuclear power plants were built, for example, if you look at Michigan, Michigan has three nucle operating nuclear power plants, two on, the, uh, on Lake Michigan, Palisades and Cook, and one here right close to Toledo in, in Monroe, Fermi too. When those plants were being built in the late 60s and early 70s, it was recognized that those nuclear power plants, because they're huge plants, you cannot cycle them up and down and you cannot follow the demand curve that the average consumer or industry needs, <clears throat> which generally peaks in the middle of the day. You cannot follow that with a 1,000 megawatt nuclear power plant. So it was recognized that they needed storage. We've kind of forgotten about that, but there was a, an important storage facility, which was pumped hydroelectricity that was built at the same time as those nuclear power plants were built, and that's the Ludington pump storage. And when I talk to people about that, most people are not aware that there's a, a huge facility in Ludington, Michigan, which, is, which was built because the nuclear power plants needed the storage, and they needed a place to, to send the power at night when the, when the demand was very low. So having or needing storage is not a new thing. It's, it's been around for 40 or 50 years. Yeah, the <clears throat> uh, I, I, people criticize wind and solar because they're not constant, but <clears throat> nuclear plants have exactly the opposite problem. They are constant, and they have to pump out at full blast whether you need that power or not. And I think that's something that people forget. It was, it, it's exactly. interesting, interesting when uh, New York State deregulated their um, electricity grid, They, I was watching the prices going up and down because I, I was actually, I had a company we were considering going into the clean energy supply business. So I was watching what happened to the prices and what happened is that the nuclear plants actually bid their power at nighttime onto the grid at negative prices. That is, they paid mm -hmm. 
to have their power taken because they could not oh my god not generate it which had a a double effect of temporarily suppressing prices and driving all the competing cleaner energy sources out of business because they couldn't compete because they weren't able to put any power on the grid because the nukes were there dominating with their you know 1000 megawatts uh but it also and then once all the competition w- went out of business then of course New York state uh, the generators left, which were mainly the were the nukes and some of the other coal plants and things, they bumped their prices up skyrocket. So there was once the competition was gone, they they now have the highest uh, electrical costs in the country, in some of the places in New, in New York. But right. but it showed that the the nukes basically are inflexible. The nukes do not meet demand, as you say, they can't ramp up and down to match what we we've got, and so the new storage technologies that are coming online are making wind and solar much more practical than nukes literally ever were. But let me let me ask you, uh, Al, let's back up a step or two. Could you give us our, your your bona fides there? I forgot to to say what your you know why what your uh, okay. credentials are here. Well, uh, I'm I'm retired from the University of Toledo where I, I taught for about 25 years. And I've been retired several years. Um, I was um, a member of the physics and astronomy department, and my specialty was to focus on solar electricity. So I collaborated for many years with uh, Solar Cells Incorporated and First Solar as they were developing the technology, which has made them the largest manufacturer of solar panels in the in the United States and one of the largest in the world, using a, a new thin film technology. So uh, when I retired, I started a small research and development company looking for new applications for solar electricity, such as semi-transparent windows and automotive sunroofs and things like that. So I stayed active in the in the solar field after after I retired several years ago. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. And so if anyone has any questions for Al at 866-240-1065, we'd be happy to take your call. And uh, you have on, you have at your fingertips, you have an expert on solar energy. And so if you're one of these, let's call them doubters, one of these people that were saying, oh, we can't possibly survive without the nukes, we have an expert here who can uh, talk about how, yes, we can survive without the nukes. Yippers. yeah, I have a Chrysler Pacifica so, hybrid, and uh, one of the things I've I've often thought about it is I wish it had solar panels on the top and on the side because I can't always find a plug. But if it's just sitting in my driveway on a sunny day, it could be it could be charging up that way if it were covered in solar panels. Totally. Right. So there there are a variety of a variety of applications that could work. Uh, one of the, one of the things that's most attractive from my point of view is the sunroof. Sunroofs keep getting larger and larger, and you'll never be able to have a sunroof large enough to collect enough electricity to power you while you're driving. But when, when you're parked in the sun, and most cars, frankly, are used for commuting and for small trips to the grocery store and so on, and most of the time it sits parked in a sunny parking lot, you could be charging your your batteries at that point. And furthermore, let's talk about those lithium-ion batteries that are used for powering transportation. As as most people know, we're moving toward a greater electrification of our transportation industry. But those batteries also can provide low-leveling opportunities so that when you come home in, in the evening and you start using lots of electricity for cooking and so on, you could you could be plugged in, in with your automobile to supply electricity for the grid and help to smooth out those peak demand curves. So the grid to vehicle and vehicle to grid are some of the interesting high technology applications for the future. Yeah, that that is a cool point that, that you can you could conceivably be using your car if it's a, a hybrid or an electric car. Uh, as a powerhouse for your house, and so if you have, like, say, let's say you have solar panels on your roof, 
you know, and so you've got your car plugged into your household grid there. So the power from the sun, when you're not using it, could be charging those batteries. And then, as you say, when you get home, if you need it, you could just draw off your car battery and, you know, not not really take much off the grid at all. Also very handy if there's a blizzard. I remember in the, the blizzard of 78, everybody was coming to the one house that had gas heat because all the electricity, all the electrical lines are down. It's, that's very short line at best. Right. If you had that problem, you just plug your car into your house. Well, that's exactly the case. So in 1998, my wife, my son, and my uh, brother-in-law, we converted um, a, a pickup a Chevy uh, or a GMC S15 to operate uh, on batteries. These were standard lead-acid batteries. So I, I commuted to the university for about 14 years with a, a converted GMC S15. And when we built a new house in 2004, we set it up so that we could plug our car, my truck, into the house for emergency power. And, and so this was a, a vehicle that had 26-volt batteries, lead-acid batteries. It was a 120-volt DC system. So we have inverters in the garage that would take the power from the batteries and use it for emergency power. We could run our house for, for four to five days on the battery storage from the vehicle that was in our garage. Wow. Nice. So, Very you, nice. Yeah, that, that's cool. We put, hmm? we built, when we built our house, we put the first solar panels on the roof. So the energy that was going into the vehicle was also solar power. <laughs> So basically, you had a battery bank that you could drive to the store if you needed to. Yeah, that's right. No, that's cool. So the the technology exists, and it's really not very difficult at all. And this is really the future. Then we can generate our electricity from solar and wind with no pollution, and we can use that for heating and cooling our houses, and we can use it for our transportation system as well. So I guess probably what's needed to get all this rolling would be more sort of I, – I heard years ago there was a, a program of government incentives, incentives for homeowners to uh, invest and switch over, and I don't know if that went anywhere or not. You mean switch from uh, natural gas to electricity? or from, it, to, to switch so to solar, to basically. put in solar panels and things, yeah. Oh, yeah. So the state of Ohio has a um, – Incentive program, which was started in 2008, this was Senate Bill 221, which is now under attack, actually. This brings up the question of House Bill 6, which is now a hot topic, and maybe you don't want to go into that. But, yeah, well, but, we, we um, are actually, we, we've been covering House Bill 6 from the beginning. We've been known to go into that. And, and uh, we're, we're going <laughs> yeah. to have, have an update on it uh, after the bottom of the hour. And this is unfortunate because House Bill 6, not, 6 would not only – bail out the, uh, the uneconomical nuclear power plants, Davis, Bessie, and Perry, but it would also um, terminate the incentive program for that was set up in Senate Bill 221, which provides incentives both for energy efficiency and for um, renewable power. Joy. So basically, yes, Rebecca, it's a great idea. Hey, we're doing it, <laughs> but if House Bill 6 goes through, we're going to stop. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Right. House Bill 6 is just the gift that goes keeps on giving, isn't it? Yeah. So so many layers of bad <laughs> yes. in that bill. It's amazing. So so Al, yeah. so you were kind of way out in the forefront there. You were you were literally a decade ahead of the country in terms of applying this technology and predicting it and um what do you see the future being for the US? Do you think we're going to move in that direction or do you think with enough really bad legislation, we're going to fall back into the, the 50s and 60s. Well, I think, um, first of all, the arguments for needing to, to do something to protect the environment is, are becoming more and more compelling. So we, de we definitely will be making the, the change. But it, unfortunately, the United States has been very slow, and the state of Ohio has, has been reactionary in terms of those kinds of solutions. But... But, but in the end, the evidence is too strong to, to keep denying it. So the, 
climate change deniers will in the end be defeated, but hopefully sooner rather than later. But one of the things that's important to recognize is that the renewable technologies have become very cheap. So, and I'll give you an example of that. When we, when we built our house in 2004 and installed solar panels, those panels cost us about $3 per watt, per peak watt. And I recently upgraded to a new version, but again, acquired from First Solar. And those panels, those panels cost 40 cents per watt. Wow. So the price came down in, in 14 years, came down from $3 a watt to 40 cents a watt. On the other hand, nuclear power, we were promised in the 60s that nuclear electricity, nuclear-powered electricity was going to be so cheap we wouldn't have to use energy meters, electricity meters on our houses anymore. And the yeah. first house that I lived in, in in Sylvania, was built at that time. It was built with all electric heat, but all of those houses have now been converted to use natural gas because the electricity prices have only gone up. Partly, and, and northern Ohio has had some of the most expensive electricity in the state of Ohio, largely because it was we have a large fraction of our electricity that comes from nu- nuclear power. So the nuclear power, the costs have not come down. On the other hand, wind and solar, the costs have come down dramatically. So I see this as inevitable that we will make this switch because we no longer need to be talking about wind and solar needing subsidies to to, to make it in the in the competitive marketplace. But Joe they was saying earlier people. that. Sorry, uh, that uh, Europe was kicking our butts, quote unquote, with uh, with alternative energy. I think it's more that we have somehow developed the agility to, to kick our own butts. <laughs> yes, indeed. It's mostly us. Indeed. And, yeah, and the problem is that we have not we have not uh, costed in the external external costs of coal generation, natural gas generation, or nuclear. That we don't fully pay the the costs of those generating uh, forms of electricity. Yeah, they're always so trying to pretend did. like, it. you know, those things are cheaper, but, the, you know, they, they leave a lot out of that equation is the problem. Yeah, actually, the, the cost <laughs> the cost of the nuclear power from, like, Davis Bessie never reco- recouped the construction costs because mm. they they were paying on the, the bill, and, and, of course, the construction costs were way higher than they predicted, because there's literally never been a nuclear plant that came in on time or under budget, or even within budget. Right. And, and so, and, and typically, so typically those construction term last for for a decade or so. Right. And so, when they built the Vespesi, they had all this this huge cost. They were paying paying it down, and then when Ohio went to a competitive electricity market which we're in right now, but which we no, will no longer be in if House Bill 6 passes, the First Energy said, oh, we're still paying on our nuke plant. You can't burden us with that and expect us to compete. Mm-hmm. And so they got a $9 billion bailout at that point to cover their remaining, what they called at the time, stranded um, costs, <clears throat> which um, which is the only reason, literally, that we still have those nuke plants running because – they went to the legislature, and the legislature bailed them out then to the tune of nine billion. Now they're bailing them out to the tune of one and a half billion. Because they more or less lied about how much it was going to cost to begin with, right? I yeah, mean, that was the basic lie. <laughs> so we need to give them money because they lied. Right. That's that's the Poor that's how the nuclear industry <laughs> continues to yeah. function today. And uh, and they uh, and they spent a lot of money to upgrade their plant in order to make a case for the. 20-year extension on their license, which was granted but you know, about two years ago, and and now after they got a 20-year license extension, now suddenly they're going to declare bankruptcy. Right, and then you know they got the their unions to to lobby us lobby for this House Bill six, and as soon as they got House Bill six, then they went to uh, eliminate the unions' pensions. You know they they. Right. They're, you know, they're, it's unscrupulous that, uh, that they they will do literally anything to get keep their nukes running, and in fact, and including 
short-circuiting and destroying the democratic process in the state of Ohio. That that doesn't matter to them either. So, uh, and furthermore, and furthermore, the the uh, cleanup costs for decommissioning of the nuclear power plants are not fully paid for. There is a fund that pays for some of it, but we still don't have as a nation. We do not have um, long-term disposal facility for high-level nu- nuclear radioactive waste. Right, and so they used to they used to claim that nukes were cheap, but they left out the construction costs, and they left out the taking care of the nuclear waste costs, and they left out the um, upgrades to the plants and so forth. <laughs> and so they were at one point able to make an argument that we're kind of almost competitive if you take out all those other costs. <laughs> but now, with what wind and solar have done, cost wise. Even giving them all those, you know, gimmies, all those exceptions, they're still much more expensive than the wind and the solar. And yet we're the fuzzy-headed pie-in-the-sky dreamers here, in the, in, according to them. All righty then. <laughs> yeah, I remember when we went to see the hearings in Columbus uh, for House Bill 6, They, it, it was pretty clear they had basically blackmailed the the union people into testifying for them. They had these poor guys up there, and they were they were basically... I forget how they worded it, but they were like, well, there are, but it's not a great, great bill, but we got to vote for it because we have to have some kind of bill of this kind passed for us to keep our jobs. I, they pretty much came out and said that. Yeah. Was... And then you know, and after they blackmailed them into saying that, then they did bad stuff to the union. <laughs> yeah. So, not, yeah. So that's, There's gratitude for you. Job, yeah, and jobs is an interesting uh, point to discuss. So I just looked at the Solar Energy Industries <clears throat> Association website for solar jobs in, in the state of Ohio. There are over 7,000 solar jobs in the state of Ohio. And Davis Bessie, I think, employs about 700 people on that location. Yeah. So there are 10 times more solar jobs in the state of Ohio than uh, nuclear power, power plant employees in, in Davis Bessie. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, if they were focused on unionizing the workers in the solar and alternative energy fields, uh, they would the unions would be much bigger and much stronger. Instead, they're focusing on trying to hold on to those last few jobs that they've got at the nuke plants and that strategically they're they're making a huge mistake. But uh, but we know that in other places around the world, wind and solar are growing by leaps and bounds, just just not here in Ohio. And so the main point I wanted to get to by having you on, Al, is to people are always tossing that the it's not practical thing at wind and solar energy. And I just wanted to emphasize, drive home the point that it is practical right now. And would you would you concur with that? Yes, I, absolutely. And not only is it practical, but it's also the lowest cost solution for supplying electricity. Maybe I can make one, one more point that relates to development of technology. One of the things that uh, when we talk about storage, when I mentioned Ludington pumped hydro storage as low, helping to load level when Fermi 2 and, and uh, the other plants in Michigan were, were built, is that you need a low-cost way of transmitting electricity over long distances. And, of course, we know that we're using an alternating current system these days because one of the reasons is that you can raise the voltage and so you can transmit lots of power at very high voltage. So the um, Cook power plant in Michigan is connected to a 765-kilovolt transmission line that wheels power into Indiana and other places in Michigan. Nowadays, the newest development there for wheeling power over long distances is to use DC. It it turns out to be more efficient to use high-voltage DC lines that are up to 1,000 kilovolts uh, uh, voltage. And and you can transmit power over 1,000 kilometers for less than a 10% cost, less than 10% um, loss. Uh, over long distances, and having a, a modern grid is very important for this load leveling. So you can use wind power 
from Indiana if the wind is blowing there or from Illinois or Iowa and wheel it to to Toledo at very low cost. So having a well-developed modern DC grid for high voltage transmission is another important aspect for load leveling. And this is recognized by the transmission companies such as PJM and the Midwest mm-hmm. Interconnect as well. well so the transmission companies know that and the technology is advancing so that this becomes more and more possible and cheaper every day. So Al, um, how does how does that work? I mean, we were taught back in you know high school that if you increase the DC current, you know you need to have a thicker thicker wire, and that's why transmission of DC over long distances right. isn't wasn't practical. So, but what's happened? What's the difference? Is it just that now they can bump DC up to voltages they weren't able to hit before, or how did this become Correct. the practical way to do it? Correct. Well, let me just give you an illustration. So our fluorescent light bulbs used to have ballast, transformer ballast that would um, regulate the, the, the current flowing through the uh, the tube. And we've now replaced all of our transformer ballasts with, um, with electronics, which generate um, a high frequency. And, and so they're much more efficient in terms of changing, controlling the current going through the, the uh, tube. So it's modern electronics. Okay. Modern electronics that allow you, when you go, when you use higher frequencies, it becomes much high, much easier to raise and lower the voltage rather than 60 hertz, the typical AC um, frequency in America. And um, uh, okay. so this, these ballasts, these electronic ballasts in our tubular fluorescence or the the compact fluorescent bulbs also involve an electronic ballast. But this is a similar technology to what's used for stepping up and stepping down, DC to DC voltage converter. So in my truck, for example, in my electric truck, which operated at 120 volts DC, I had a DC to DC converter that would generate the 12 volts that I still needed for operating my headlights and radios and Hmm. wipers and things like that. I see. So the DC to DC converter is just using modern electronics, which is very, very efficient. Cool. In the same way, you can use this to boost voltages from 120 volts up to 1,000 um, kilovolts for those high voltage which would transmission be lines. 1,000, 1,000 volts, which would be a million volts. Right. Oh, wow. Exactly. Okay. All right. Well, Al, thank you so much for being our guest. we we got to move on here. Um, but we really okay. appreciate you sharing your time and expertise with us. Thanks very much. Well, keep keep up the good work. Enjoy talking with you. Right. you too. Thanks. Bye. All right. So now we have to. We will be have time for a call or two. Eight six six two four zero one zero six five. But we have to. And we. It's not like we have to. We enjoy uh, talking about our sponsors here. So um, for a great future, one of our sponsors is the Wood County Park District. Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, provide engaging programming, and they teach people to love and respect nature. They restore wildlife habitats, and they lead outdoor adventures. The Wood County Parks protects 20 parks and nature preserves around Wood County, and they're open from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every day of the year. And uh, a couple ways to contact them. One, you can call them anytime at 419-353-1897. You can download their app. Just go to the app store and look for WC Parks. They've got a great app. And uh, of course, they're on the web at wcparks.org. Now, there's one uh, event coming up that they particularly wanted us to tell you about, and that is on October 15th, Tuesday, October 15th, 5 to 7 p.m., at the Wood County Historical Center and Museum, which is at 13660 County Road, Road County Home Road in Bowling Green, they're going to have a scarecrow contest and workshop. Oh, yeah. cute. Community scarecrow contest and workshop, and they're offering cash prizes, $100 for first place, $50. Which is a completely for... ecologically sound method of pest control, by the way. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, you don't, scarecrows. Have, to, don't have to spray for crows. You just put out a scarecrow. <laughs> So $100 for first place, $50 for second, $25 for third, 
And what they will do is they'll supply you with the poles and the straw and the twine, but then you bring everything else. You bring the outfit. You know, if if <laughs> right. if you're you know, if you've got that, that thing hanging in the that thing from the eighties. Yeah. Hanging, <laughs> right. Like that Michael Jackson suit that you bought back in nineteen eighty five. Yeah. Uh with the big shoulder pads and everything. If you want to turn that into a scarecrow, uh bring it over to the um Wood County Historical Center and Museum, Tuesday, October fifteenth, from five to seven. And uh enjoy. So oh, we have a caller on the line. That's great. And we'll get to her in just a second, but uh, one more thing that I wanted uh, Becca to mention about the Wood County Parks. You were at a Wood County Park just yesterday, weren't you? I was, yeah. Last night, some friends of mine had their uh, wedding at the little shelter house in Otsego Park, which I had completely forgotten that there was a park in Bowling Green that, that is against the uh, Maumee River there. But right. apparently, the I, township. I remember I actually went swimming there once in the 1980s. I'm not sure whether you're allowed to swim there or not, but we did it. <laughs> But it's a beautiful little shelter house. It's just, you know, rustic, and, you know, stone and fireplaces and things. And then they have like a deck and and these beautiful stone stairs that go down to a little sort of patio area where you can have all the chairs for the wedding. And yeah. uh, there's a little path, you know, you can go down and explore near the river if you want. It's just gorgeous. Yeah. So Wood County Parks are full of those sorts of things. Playground so. equipment, too. Yeah. And uh, so we have one other sponsor I wanted to mention. That's Damar Consulting. DeMar Consulting is a computer consulting firm. They will come to your home and help you with any sort of computer problem. If you need backup or if your computer's running slow or if your computer's not talking to your printer or maybe your computer's not casting to your TV set, and, you know, it's, that can be really frustrating because you want to just sit there and watch stuff and, yeah. and you can't. So um, everyone at DeMar Consulting has a degree in computer science, so you know that they know what they're talking about. And if you'd like to get a hold of them, there's two ways. One is to call them, 419-973-3000. That's 419-973-3000. Call or text. Or you can go to their website, which is simply demarconsulting.com. Demar spelled D-E-M-A-R-E, then the word consulting.com. Demar Consulting for all your home computing needs. All right, so now we can go to our very patient caller. Hello, caller, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. Hello. Hello. <laughs> yeah, um, I was calling in because uh, I was listening to your show last week, and I'm really enjoying it quite a bit. Okay, oh, um, thanks. But the, I, I wanted to do a slight fact check on a comment Becca had made. She had mentioned the young girl, Autumn Peltier, uh, who's a uh, First Nation water protector out of Canada who has been making some big headlines. Uh, at so the same I, didn't time even, as I didn't remember her name, Her name, so you know, you're know, so, you doing okay, really yeah. well. Thank you I, for that. I knew yes. who you were referencing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> Autumn Paltier. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yes. And um, I, I decided, I was like, wow, you know, maybe I should look her up and get a little bit more on her myself and everything. But she really is an impressive young lady, but she is not nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize, like Becca said. She's nominated for something close, which is called the International Children's Peace Prize. Oh, there we go. Um, and, but they are, the winners are presented by Peace Prize laureates. And uh. the Peace, the Nobel is, Affili- has affiliations with it, but it's still a separate entity unto itself. So it's more of a spin-off awarding... <laughs> from the... Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. It's, okay. it's, it's kind yeah, of like it's... Muppet Baby exactly. Nobel Prize winners. Right. Okay, all right. Well, But that's, yeah. okay, still a, a great honor. That's that's it, Absolutely. It's a good uh, problem I... to have when you have too many TJ, teenagers uh, getting major prizes for environmental activism, and it gets confusing. <laughs> I know. I love it. I yeah. think it's great. All right. Well, um, and I wanted to mention that last year the recipient was all together the March for Our Lives from right here in the USA. Cool. And I thought that was really impressive because I was looking over the list of recipients because they started uh, giving out the award in 2005 and just people from all over. 
and the stipulation for uh, winning is uh, it annually goes to a child who's made significant contribution contribution to advocating children's rights and improving the situation of vulnerable children. That's wonderful. So it's a very broad, like the examples they use are uh, such as orphans, child laborers, and children with HIV AIDS. Mm-hmm. But looking through the list, obviously it encompasses so much more than that. And the the winner gets to choose uh, how to assign a one hundred thousand or one hundred twenty three thousand uh, dollar reward or a hundred thousand euro award oh. to go to any children's organizations. Oh, that's wonderful! Okay. All right, well, fingers and are that's crossed. What for... is... Yes. Yeah. Good luck to her. It's for Miss Peltier. Indeed. All right. All right. Well, thanks so much for the call. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yep. Thank right. you very much for having me. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks. All right. Well, we've just got a few minutes left here to cover a couple things. One is I wanted to get to our letter from the future. My great great granddaughter Marie I, who faithfully every week sends a letter back in time, which appears next to my bed before I get up to do the show. Uh, there's this flash of photons, and uh, so she writes this week, uh, dear great great grandpa. Actually, this it's cute. She initialized it to dear G G G. Just that should be G cubed in the future. I think. <laughs> there we go. Uh, just a short letter today. It's gotten very cold up here on the Kola Peninsula. There's already about 10 inches of snow on the ground and temperatures in the 20s. It's beautiful, but I see from the records of your time when global warming was still in a runaway feedback loop that temperatures were in the 40s. Part of me kind of wishes that was still it was still that warm. But at least we've gotten back to a normal climate, and it is fun to go cross-country skiing with Michael. Keep fighting climate change, great-great-grandpa. The Earth is much better off because you guys finally stopped putting carbon into the air. Love, Marie. I. Oh, so, yeah, that's cute. All right, and then there was just one more topic I wanted to introduce this week, and this is, oh, actually, no, let's do the HB6 update first. HB6. Yes, well, HB6... Just when you thought it couldn't get uglier, it got uglier. Oh. The um, pro HB6 forces are tossing tons and tons of money, hiring literally people off the street to go in and harass these petitioners. And their latest trick is a fake petition. Oh, my God. Yes. They, they also have a petition, which is a petition that says something on the top about foreign control of the grid or foreign control of energy policies and their petition is literally nothing it's not a a petition that would create a new law it's not a petition that would create a referendum it's literally just a petition that would get your signature and confuse people about whether or not they've signed the real hb6 petition I saw. I, I was at the bus lineup, which, by the way, in Toledo, they they have uh, they have a thing called the bus hub now, uh, which basically means that they have put the the. Where, if you go downtown, if you catch a bus downtown, or if you want to change to another bus to get to the other side of town, you have to get go to this area now that is way far away from any downtown businesses. Literally, no one can no one can see you from the police station anymore, or there are no businesses. It's like this weird little isolated area up in North Toledo, so that the mm. poor people don't bother the. And what did you see there? I saw a guy wearing a T-shirt uh, with a pen on it that said "Decline" on it. Oh. So they have T-shirts now. Yeah, they they are just flooding all the venues. Um, with all that money, they could find an honest way to live and make a living. You know, <laughs> you'd think. <laughs> yeah. And I, I suppose that's a side benefit of fighting HB6 because we've employed yeah. tens of thousands <laughs> it's of people true. all over Ohio. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You're welcome for your job, but please just don't do it very well. Yeah. You know, let this let the petition signatures do their job. Um the real petitions on the front of the petition it says referendum petition and on the signature pages, it's got a little notice up in the top about how it's illegal to sign a referendum petition intentionally more than once. So look for that if someone comes at you with a petition. And if it's some other thing, uh, just tell them, you know, forget it. Go on about your business, you know, because they're going to earn their money whether they actually successfully prevent you from signing or not. So you don't have to worry about that on their part. I think that girl that the that I assigned at the climate change rally was for real. Yeah. 
Well, uh, and probably at uh, the climate change rally, that's a good good indication that that was probably the, the, the actual petition. But I am considering, and stay tuned for next week, I'm considering creating a private petition signing event oh, where nice. you could come and safely, without fear of being harassed, actually sign the referendum, the real referendum HB6 petition. So uh, stay tuned next week for a time and place on that. And uh, let's see. So the other, the last thing I really wanted to mention, just about out of time already, is something called the the Mission Do Aquifer. And I'm just going to mention it here because this is going to be a very big issue in the coming years and months. Um, there's a, an aquifer under Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, hence the name Mission Do Aquifer. And that aquifer is threatened. There, there's a whole bunch of people that want to drill and start pumping it out. Some have suggested 7 million gallons a day. Some have suggested they're going to take it out at 10 millions, millions of gallons a day. There's a company that wants to do a, a quote-unquote test well, and they want to pump out at 120 million ga- gallons a day uh, as, their, as their quote-unquote test. Which um, We'll talk more about this, but all over the world, whenever aquifers get start to get tapped and drilled and drained there's all kinds of environmental catastrophes that happen because of that mm-hmm. and we need to avoid those catastrophes you know if you see a catastrophe happen to like a hundred different places where they've done this exactly the same thing you know if you're the hundred and first place you should be able to say we're not going to do it <laughs> we're not going to do that you know i saw it cause disaster here 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 no reason to think we'd be any different. So so anyway, thanks very much for listening. This is Joe Damar. And Rebecca Wood. And we really appreciate your listenership and we're signing off. No,